All right, it's time for our next Bull in the Basement. And listen, to be quite honest, these can't all be gold. Um, I'm joined now by one of my best friends. He uh, and I, both of us, have had incredible jobs throughout our years. He was part of my wedding. We were roommates for a couple of years. That's a whole other podcast for another day. Uh, his name is Paul Leone. He lives in Webster, New York, and he is the executive director of the New York State Craft Beer Association. He has an incredible studio, as you can see behind him, with a great layout that I'm a little bit jealous of. I mean, people have, have done this and have looked at mine and said, oh, my God, that's so cool. I, I love yours. And we'll get into some of that background here in a second. But hi, pal. What's up, buddy? I know. Uh, it's I, I haven't seen that? you in a while. I don't. No kidding. And it's weird to, to do this. Because, like, we don't do this. We text or we call or we see each other in person. We've never, I don't think, done a, a, a Zoom-style chat together. Nope. Or any nope. kind of professional interview together. No, nope. just drinking at your house and drinking yeah. at my house. Yeah, not this isn't really professional, by the way. That was no. not correctly Sorry. categorized. Run um, with that. I'm, and we're doing this before noon, so I apologize um, because I'm not drinking. I do, by the way, have Community Beer Works on tap. Good. Uh, really? in my uh in my man cave in my basement so um any buffalo brewers um you want a spot in the basement six stills are great gears great maybe an interview i'm for sale <laughs> paul knows yes, i like beer is. yeah right right so, yes anyway uh here we are and i mentioned that we had great jobs you know we grew up together we basically went to college together and we sort of went through internships together and stuff like that. And you kind of went in the video direction. I was going to go, the hopes were in the front of camera TV world, but I wasn't pretty enough, quite frankly. And they smartly decided to put me into a radio booth. And they always say, I have a face for radio. And somebody was right. And it worked out yeah. for a really long time. Um, at any rate, so most of you that are watching this know that I've had a hell of a job and a hell of a, a, a um, career life to this point. That, of course, was abruptly ended. Whatever. That's another podcast, too. Um, you also have had some really, really, really cool jobs. Your job now, I tell you all the time, is like a dream job, dude. Like, for anybody that likes beer and you like beer, to do what you get to do on a daily basis, and I get it, it's a grind at times, and there's paperwork and red tape and BS you got to go through pretty much on a daily basis. But, and we'll get into the nuts and bolts of what you do for a living. Pretty cool, man. Well, it's a job that we all studied for in college, right? right. Pretty regularly. <laughs> you and me both, right? Yep. I mean, we studied hard. We worked hard. We, weren't, we didn't waste time <laughs> drinking beer in college. We, had, we needed that knowledge and experience when we got older. To, to either work in it or discuss it, right? Right. And, and so to your point, as we have aged, so has the beer industry and our palates, right? Because we know what we were drinking in college, you know, the Beasts, the Meister Brows, the Hams, the Peels, the Golden Anniversary, the Matt's Beer Balls. We, no knock to any of them. Beer. They're great no. for beer pong. Yeah. Right? And to drink lots of. Matt's Beer Balls. Yeah. Um, but- as we have aged, our palates have aged as well and be gotten much more refined. And thankfully, the craft beer revolution happened and has landed you into a terrific position. So I want to get into what you're doing with beer in a little bit. But before doing that, you had another incredible job at the Baseball Hall of Fame. And I don't know if I've ever publicly thanked you for this, what? but you allowed me one of the greatest opportunities I've ever had in my life which was to voice a World Series video that actually ran in the Hall of Fame that tens of thousands I of people saw. I forgot about that. Yeah, I forgot about that because you have a great voice. And I said, well, I'm going to reach out to my friend, Rich. And yeah, and, I forgot all about that. And, and I listen, so the, the, the one time that I walked through and I actually saw it and I was blown away, it's like, I cannot believe my voice is in the Baseball Hall of Fame. This is nuts, mm -hmm. right? And, and clearly the people that were above you didn't like it very much because I didn't get asked back to do another one. But um, when, I, when I did come to visit you the, the one time in Cooperstown, you know, we were walking through and you said, here it is. And it was part of this great World Series display and I was blown away. So I don't know if you were just being a great friend and just plugged it in just for that moment because you may have done that. Nope. Uh, and it never ran outside of that five minutes that I saw it. Regardless, 
I don't think I've ever thanked you publicly for that opportunity because that was awesome, man. Thank you. You didn't need to thank me. It was, I hired you because it was a great voice and I thought it was perfect for that. So no, are you kidding? You did great. No, so I, no, no. Wow. I didn't, even, I totally forgot about that. Yeah. That's cool. I, I'll you, never forget you talk, that. You talk about, oh, well, like one of the things I'll never forget and I'll share a story uh, about you and me and, and I'll never forget this either. When you were in early in your career, when we were going to college, St. John Fisher, uh, and are taking our little broadcast classes and you were interning for Brother Wee's and, um, and we're really going to date ourselves here a little bit. And you said, hey, look at uh, there's the, uh, Sam Kennison's coming to town and uh, he's going to you know, come to the studio and, and you know, let's do a video project together, interviewing or, or videotaping Sam Kennison. And it was the craziest morning. Uh, so talk about thanking like I, that, that to me to be in Sam Kennison's presence, you know, because he died, I think, shortly thereafter. But, you know, this was he was he was apparently sober um, as he strolls in at what, six in the morning with with a posse of people, uh, a stripper who, who got naked uh, and what wine coolers or something that they were all drinking, pounding wine coolers. And uh, long story short, uh, we videotaped most of the morning um, and then uh, we actually got an interview with him. And, and it was the funniest little interview. And we're just two college kids. And the fact that he like spent a little time with us and did a little stick with us uh, was something I thought was cool. And, and I gave that to Brother Weez. We think I we recorded it, and it uh, a few years ago when I moved back to Rochester. And it really rattled him because he remembers that morning like yesterday. I think it was the yeah. last time he saw Kennison alive. Well, no, I appreciate that. Um, mm -hmm. and, and enough of the mutual admiration society. Um, I, I think we appreciate what both of us have done in our careers and in our lives. But stay on the Baseball Hall of Fame, man, because I know you have, mm -hmm. again, the, the, the one time you took me on the walkthrough was we were in a little bit of a hurry and there was, you know, there were certainly rules and all of that. But, you know, you took me back into part of the vault and mm -hmm. I saw stuff that most people never are able to see. And in your time there, man, Talk about the stuff you, you saw and touched in terms of baseball history. I mean, it, I'm just making things up here, just spitballing, but you probably, there was probably like Jackie Robinson's first Brooklyn Dodger hat or like the glove that Willie Mays had when he made the over the shoulder catch in center field or, you know, whatever. And you had met so many Hall of Famers. So share a couple of, of maybe some artifact stories and some of the, the, the Hall of Famer stories that, 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 you know, some of the guys that you met over the years when you were there. I think, so I, I, I was there in 93 to 99. So I would say from Rizzuto to Ryan kind of was the Rizzuto, Phil Rizzuto was the first induction, um, Steve Carlton. Um, but I, I, I had this picture. It's funny, I looked back over the pandemic. I you know, started cleaning out photos and stuff. And there's a picture of me holding four bats that we were, we had, I had to go in the archive and get um, to shoot for a commercial. And it was uh, during the McGuire Sosa thing. So when that was all over, um, I had to get uh, Babe Ruth's 60th home run bat. I had to get Roger Maris's 61st, Sammy Sosa's 66th, and, and McGuire's 70th. And I had them all in my hand, just kind of walking. And it's like, that was crazy to me. You know, white gloves, of course. Um, and then, you know, we had to do this thing. I had to get Shoe Shoeless Joe Jackson's shoes um, once for a shoot. Um, you know, and you're right, like the, the Willie Mays' gloves and all that, like it just, it was all there. Whenever we needed to, to shoot it, then we just go into the archives and, and get it. And, and, you know, just to be able to appreciate that history. And, but I think I was there during kind of the best years, because when I was there from 93 to, to 99, the guys that were coming back every year, you know, was, you know, was Phil Rizzuto, Stan Musial, um, Yogi Berra, Sandy Koufax, you know, a lot of guys. Um, are, are they're all gone now, right? Yeah, Hank and that Aaron, really right? was, yeah, and Hank Aaron. Like, this is the history, Willie Mays. Um, you know, and, and it's just uh, the history of seeing those guys all together, um, in the visualization of you know, Bob Feller yelling at somebody because you know, he was Bob Feller, you know, and and all of the great stories. And I got to ride on, I uh, got to ride on three holes of a, a um, we were shooting Phil Rizzuto on the golf course. And, and I, so I got to ride with him, you know, videotaping that segment with him. And, and I go, Hey, Mr. Rizzuto, he goes, Mr. Rizzuto, call me Scooter. And I'm like, there's no <laughs> way I'm calling you Scooter. There's just no way I'm calling you Scooter. You're Phil Rizzuto crying out loud. And the funny thing is, is like, you've got Rizzuto and, and, and Yogi Berra. I was shocked on how small they were. Right. You know, you look at the ball players today and they're all like six foot five, 280 pound shortstop. 
Phil Rizzuto was five foot nothing. And he was the shortstop for the New York Yankees, you know, during the same thing with uh, Yogi Berra. You know, it's crazy. Yeah, pretty amazing. And the cool thing, so this is a, a really good segue. Everything's sort of come full circle. You've, you've still been friendly to Cooperstown since you've left, but Cooperstown has one of the premier craft breweries in really the world right in terms of oma gang i know you, you guys are going to do a an event there in a couple of weeks so talk a little bit about that before we get into your job because i know there will be people that and i know there's people in western new york and in and, and central new york that are watching this that probably imbibe the oma gang and whatever kind of of beer that they like that oma gang produces that might be interested in making that trek to cooperstown to be part of your festival there's a lot of breweries in Cooperstown now, but when we were there in the 90s, you know, these two awesome, this little brewery opened up called Cooperstown Brewing Company, you know, and they're like, wow, this is really good beer. And then Brewery Oma Gang opened. And this was in the 90s. Like, this is way before craft beer was kind of really taking off. And boy, you know, you had Hennepin for the first time. So Oma Gang has been around for a long time and, and they're still an amazing, amazing space. And we're, we're doing um, uh, a beer festival concert thing. Um, we're trying to, take the beer festival model instead of four hours of drinking and adding more entertainment to it. So we added, you know, basically an all day event where it's a beer festival and live music on the main stage. And then an, like a legit concert at night, opening act and, and headliner band. And we're trying to make the, the beer drinking more experiential. And we thought, well, Brewery Oma Gang, if you've never, if you've never been to Brewery Oma Gang, you've got to go out there in Cooperstown. It's just beautiful scenery it's wide open and a lot of big bands play out there you know what i mean like modest mouse is playing this month out there yep. uh, you know lumineers have played there uh, avid brothers are have, have always played there like it's got a great reputation for concerts super cool and um you know speaking of festivals it was a couple of years ago it was pre-covid where you guys the new york state craft beer association with the local buffalo brewers put on an incredible uh, brew fest at canal side and i know you have plans to uh, put something together again soon here in Buffalo again as well, right? September 25th, Canal Side. Again, we'll always go back to Buffalo. Buffalo, um, you know, for a beer drinking region has come a long way in New York State. Like Western New York beer is legit, you know, now. And there's so many good breweries. And if you go just into downtown Buffalo and you look at what Big Ditch is and what Resurgence is doing and Community Beer Works. And if you know, I mean, you live there. Like it's just, you know, 42 North. Like these are just, they're, they're game changers out there thin man you know um and they have reputations that go beyond buffalo i was going to ask you so they're obviously and there's still craft breweries popping up here in buffalo like this is not slowing down how many craft breweries are there in new york state at this point right now um we are if we're not there already 500 um so yeah and that makes us second most in the country behind california you know it's got about 1100 so we won't catch up with them but the craft beer scene in New York is legit. You know, it totally is. Uh, it's, it's a big deal. And the, the beer quality is good. And good Lord, you can go anywhere in the state right now and, and find beer, craft beer. Yeah. Uh, Paul Leone is one of my best friends. He's the New York State Craft Beer Association Executive Director. So how respected are you mentioned we're second in the nation of craft breweries in New York State. How respected are New York State craft beers nationwide? In other words, um, aside from like winning awards and stuff, Mm -hmm. like if you were to go to Seattle or Austin or you're going to Orlando to Disney World with your family and you go into a bar in any one of those cities I mean, are you going to find New York craft beers in some of those bars nationwide you know what probably not believe it or not because they're so small so you look at um you know every state's got like their big breweries you know their breweries that are the most popular like in New York state you look at another half right other half is uh, one of those Brooklyn breweries that is, is spread out a little bit, that's kind of, they do beer festivals in Europe, you know what I mean? Because wow. of their reputation. So, um, so we have a handful of those in New York state, but the, but the other side of that is just why you're not finding them all over the country is because they're too small. You know, these are very regional type breweries and, and they don't have national distribution and that model, you know, not to bore people is kind of sale, you know, you're not going to find many craft breweries outside of like a Brooklyn brewery or Saranac that are going to be able to, and even Oma Gang to, to distribute nationally. Um, how does Buffalo, you, I think you just mentioned, you know, Western New York is, is kicking ass when it comes to their craft brewery, brewery and our craft brew scene, but how do we rank, you know, statewide for, for craft beer? I mean, would, 
where do you think it, it, it places? I know Rochester's blowing up, uh, obviously downstate in, in, in the city, they have all kinds of things going up there, but there's also obviously little small pockets around the state that have um, great breweries, but where does, where does Buffalo rank? Would you say uh, amongst all the regions in terms of craft brewing? It's tough to rank them, but I would say this, the great thing about New York is that every region has their own personality of beer. And, you know, like New York City beer is going to be a little bit different than Buffalo beer and Long Island beer is going to be different than Hudson Valley beer, just in the sense of, of the attitude that goes into the beer. And um, I think, you know, like Buffalo, for instance, I, the one thing I noticed in Buffalo is you see a lot more lighter beers. Um, you know, I mean, the, Buffalo does its share of hazy IPAs and things, but it's more of a blue collar, you know, town. And I think the lighter styles sell better in, in Western New York. And you can find all styles there, you know, but um, you know, you go to New York City and it's usually all about the hazy IPA and the hipness and all of that. So each region has its own personality. It would be tough to rank them for sure. Thank you for bringing up the different styles of beer, because I am very particular with the kinds of beers I like. Uh, and I want to get into that in a second, but I want to continue on the line of questioning in terms of like what you do. So part of your job is to sort of stump and lobby for craft brewers to get funding, um, let's be honest, most of them, at, or all of them really, at one time or another, have been startup businesses, right? Mm -hmm. So your job is basically to profess who and what they are to the people that can, especially in government, that, that can get them some money to get going, right? Well, yeah, I mean, we, we definitely are. The, so we're the trade association uh, for craft beer in New York State, the New York State Brewers Association. And so we do have a lot of contacts in Albany um, and every legislative district just to make sure brewers get the breaks that they need and to make sure we pass good laws so that you all at home can get the beer that you want, when you want and how you want it. And to stop the dumb laws um, that a lot of legislators seem to, to want to do to because it's alcohol. You know, we can't have too much alcohol because we're all children and not adults and um, all of that. So we, we, we do both. We get, try to get good laws passed and we try to, to block the dumb laws. Talk to a little bit. I know you and I have talked about this and I thought this was really interesting about how there are a lot of local farmers in, in New York state that the craft brewers in New, New York state are making use of in making their beer, right? Like you might not expect there to be hot farms, for instance, in New York, but there are and they get used. Well, not only that, I mean, before prohibition, um, the all the majority of hops in the entire United States came from New York State. Really, uh, yeah. we had forty thousand acres of hops before prohibition, and and so we were really a big state for agriculture. And then prohibition killed that industry pretty much, and then industrialization. And um, you know, we uh, before prohibition there were like three hundred and eighty breweries in, in New York State. By the end of the seventies, there were five. Wow. Um, and, and it was all big beer, you know, I mean, that's all you could get, you know, in the seventies and eighties, it was Budweiser and Miller and, and, and they're still the major players. Like they're still 87% of the entire beer market. Like craft beer is only 13% of the entire beer market, but New York state came up with a farm brewing law that gave a lot of incentives. So if you use New York state malt and hops in your beer, um, then you get some pretty good incentives. So there's, there's a lot of farm breweries in New York state. So um, before that law was created, you know, malt, you know, barley grows from the ground and then it has to be malted before it can turn into beer. And so there were no malt houses in 2013 and now there are 12, wow. uh, two in Buffalo, you know? And so, so that's a, it's another new industry because beer is agriculture. It's only four ingredients, you know, it's, you know, barley and, and water and hops and yeast and that's it. Yeah. Um, another great segue and I, I'm feeling the chemistry here, obviously, from our long-term relationship here. But so off of that, where is the industry industry growing? I mean, is there a long-term projection that it will hit the wall? I mean, will it be a, a saturation? Are they calling for that? Uh, I mean, it's beer and people drink it. I don't foresee that happening, but, and you don't want it to necessarily happen. You don't want to stunt growth. You don't want to stunt opportunity. But, you know, is there a five or 10 year or longer thing where folks are saying at some point this is going to hit the wall? The coolest thing about craft beer in the industry is the fact that if you have one brewery in Buffalo, uh, that's fine. That's cool. If you have 40 breweries in Buffalo, it becomes a destination. Right. So so really, it's one of those unique industries where they don't ever view themselves as competitors. 
you know, people come to Buffalo or any region of the state, they want to visit more than one brewery. So the more breweries there are in any region, the better it is for that region. Now, economically, um, you know, the, the vast majority of brewers, they're going to be small because they're, they're going to make most of their money out of their tap room. Um, they're going to can their own beer and sell it out of their tap room because I don't know if you guys have noticed uh, over the years, shelf space hasn't increased, right? And um, distribution has become, is, is, a, is really hard right now um, for smaller brewers. Um, and so, you know, would you rather make, you know, $5 a case or $5 a pint, you know? And so when you're in distribution, you need a wider model of things. So really their tap room is where you're going to make the money. And as long as they can support themselves doing that, canning some beer for people to take away, then, then really they can keep growing. Yeah, sure. bonus. And, and again, that is, an, again, a great segue to another question I was going to ask you, because I'll go to consumers here locally, or I'll go to like Aurora Brew Works in East Aurora. And I mean, there are, this might be a slight exaggeration, but it feels like there's hundreds of beers to choose from. And I think of that, I'm like, how the hell with all those beers on all those shelves are those guys making money? And I think you just answered the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm really out of their tap room and distribution is not really the future for most of these breweries. So, so keep visiting your local brewery, which is what most people do anyway. Sure. Yeah. Right? You want to go to a brewery and get a pint, maybe take a six pack or a crawler home or a four pack. Um, and that's kind of where we're heading, trending for sure. Uh, uh, Paul Leon, executive director of the New York State Brewers Association. So listen, I need you to break down some types of beers uh, because people see these labels or kinds or brands, I don't know what you call them, uh, flavors uh, of beer, mm -hmm. and they might not know what they are. So uh, for instance, would be a ghost. Like what, yeah. what is Goza. a ghost primarily? Oh, ghost is like a, it's like a, a sour um, in a sense. Sours have become really popular. Okay, stop, um, stop for a second. Yeah. So, so what, what, let's start with sour then and then progress to ghost. Well, I, I would, a goza is a, is, is a, is a lighter sour. It might even have a little saltiness to it. Um, you know, in some way it's, um, sours, there's a wide range of all beer styles and it's gotten to the point. The great thing of, I would say the great thing about the, the, you know, we used to be the lapping stock of the world when it came to the beer, right? It was just one style of beer that you could get here. And now we're the world leaders in beer, but really we learned everything we needed to learn from, or we learned everything from, you know, the Europeans and, and that, you know, they've been brewing beer a lot longer than us. Um, but the thing with American brewers is there's no boundaries on, on what they put in beer. I mean, you know, you've had the craziest beer things ever. I mean, they, beer, there's just like, oh, let's throw this in here and see what we get from it, you know? And so that's why you see more styles and varied styles yeah. within those styles. So yeah, you get things like ghosts and sours, uh, mm -hmm. A saison, for instance, what what, what does mm -hmm. that word mean, or what is that? I, you know, really, I, when I see when I see a saison, you know, I think of more of like a flavor profile. Saison uh, can, you know, be, you know, it's more. I love saisons. You know, even like the carbonation level of them, they can be a little clove, banana. You know, just various things that you can throw out there for for a saison. Um, they're not a hugely popular style. I mean, the most popular style, the most popular style is hazy IPA. Um, that's still the most popular style is IPA. 27% of the market is IPA. Um, and then light lagers is actually number two uh, coming up pretty quick. So in the hazy, and I've seen a lot of those all over the place, what, what makes the beers hazy? They're unfiltered for the most part. The yeah. more, you know, and that's the good thing about with IPAs. And it's crazy to me is when people are like, oh yeah, I bought... 10 cases of this uh, IPA or whatever, craft beer is meant to be drank, the vast majority of craft beer is meant to be drank right away, like within a month or two. Like there's a short self shelf life. If you have a beautiful IPA in a can, you keep it in your fridge for six months, it's not gonna be so wonderful by the time. It'll be fine to drink, but it's not gonna be as hoppy. It's not gonna be as floral. It needs to be fresh. Now, if you get a high alcohol beer, um, then you can shelve that beer and drink it whenever you want. It's got shelf life to it, like wine almost. For people that don't know, you know, you hear India pale ale. Mm -hmm. What's with the India? Yeah, that's a long story, which I don't think we have time to get into. But believe it or not, it's got so uh, long story short, um, uh, there were British troops in India and they were shipping beer from England to uh, India to the troops. Hops serves as a preservative. So they found that if they hopped the beer up enough when it shipped over, it was, it was fine by the time it got there. And so in a sense, they took a pale ale and then they 
uh, through, you know, pale ale would be like the little brother or a little sister of an IPA, if you want to look at it that way. So it's just a little, maybe a little less hoppy, but still hoppy. But that's kind of the long story short of where the name India Pale Ale came from. Very good. No, that's fair. And, and so it's a, it's basically a way to make beer. Yeah. Um, yep. You mentioned crazy beers and crazy flavors of beer and what some of the craft brewers are doing with beer these days. So I was at your house about six weeks ago, I want to say. And one of the breweries you had did some sort of a collaboration with another brewery. And this, by the way, you're seeing collaborations all over the place of breweries, you know, coming up with these particular flavors. Um, and the one that I drank looked and tasted like a wine smoothie. Yes. And I'm like, how the hell is this beer? It's a sangria beer, I think, is what I pulled out. Right. It was yeah. Crazy. It's crazy. So there are a couple of breweries in New York state. The one that I pulled out for you is Mortalis um, in Avon, which is, you know, sort of towards Buffalo, but south of Rochester. And they, uh, yeah, it's a heavily fruited sour. And so it was like, it was so thick. It was like a smoothie, right? That's why yeah. I gave it to you. Like literally on the glass, you could see the remnants of, of the fruit. Um, and that's sort of a new style of beer that that's beer and people are into it. You know, it's crazy. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. crazy. And it was, and it, by the way, it was delicious. And, it, and it's not like your traditional beer that you're going right. to get on tap or in a bottle or can. It was, it was, it was pretty remarkable. Now, is there anything disallowed? Because I will say this, most of these like fun beers that you're seeing out there that people are trying, whether it's in the tap rooms or buying in the stores or whatever, most of them have like a, like so, sort of a sweet element, right? You're not mm -hmm. seeing like a, a kale beer or a Brussels sprouts or a spinach beer, which I think just points to the fact that we all hated our vegetables when we were kids and we still hate our vegetables. And we especially don't like vegetables in our beer because you don't see a lot of vegetable beers, um, quite frankly. Because no, it would taste awful. Right. And that's why. That's why. <laughs> so that, and, that, and that's why. But but you know, when you think about brownies, like you go out to uh, Colorado and, and you have a Rocky Mountain Oyster Stout. Right. Yeah. You know, what Rocky Mountain oysters are bull. Of bull. course. Yeah. There you go. Bull yeah. testicles. And they right. actually use bull testicles in the beer to make mm. the beer. Mm. And you know what it tastes like? It tastes like a stout. Like you don't really get money, but it's more of a marketing thing. You know, you're not, you know. Well, I would, I but, would expect they anything, use them. I would expect anything made with bull testicles to be stout. It is a stout. Yeah. yeah. That very, makes sense. Very that, and that's, so, so that's brewers sensible. will push the bounds. I think when Walking Dead was really big, some, some brewery made a, a beer with like sheep brain in it or something like that, you know? So, yeah. yeah. How? It's, go ahead. No, I was going to say they use such a minor, you know, amount of it that, um, you know, you really don't, you really don't taste it. Yeah. Um, how hard is it? I mean, you're talking to brewers every single day for the most part. How hard is it for them to come up with names of beers? I mean, the, the, the beer names are always so crazy and so creative. A lot of them have topical reasons for being what they are. Some of them, you know, are like have some sort of a charity angle to them or whatever. And so they can kind of pull that into whatever the name of the beer is. Like we joked when I was doing my radio show about making, you know, Bill's themed beers, like the Kolsch mm -hmm. Beasley or the right. Stefan Cezanne, you know, like silly, stupid. But how hard is it for the, the, the brewmasters and the beer makers with their creative folk in, in all the different craft brews around the state to come up with these crazy, weird names and make sure that nobody else, crazy as it might seem, have the same thing? It's nearly impossible now. I mean, it's it's so there's over 8000 breweries in the country right now. And so they all are naming their beers, too. So if you believe it or not, that's how crazy it is. So you could get a cease and desist for using a similar name. But let's say you wanted, let's say you wanted to um, name a brewery uh, Bulls Brewery. Well, if there's a Bulls beer anywhere, they can send you a cease and desist to say you can't name your brewery that. Uh, Brooklyn Brewery was in a lawsuit. Um, you know, they've got a, um, they had a beer name um, that uh, a brewery wanted to name their brewery that. And, and they ended up fighting out it in court. Like you can't do that. So it's even equally impossible. It's, it's really impossible. So you'll go to breweries now and it'll just be IPA or the name of the brewery um, in, in IPA. So 42 North IPA or whatever, just because they don't want to get a cease and desist from somebody saying you can't use that name. But as far as beer names go, gosh, you know, there's really creative. It's funny. I always thought I'm in Rochester. And the one that I, I passed along to a lot of breweries was uh, Saison B. Anthony, I thought would be a great one, right? <laughs> awesome. And I'm like, this is a great name. But then uh, somebody said, finally said to me, it was like last month or whatever, and like, yeah, she was a suffragist. 
like she was anti-alcohol. So it's really hard for us to name. I'm like, all right, okay, fine. You know, maybe I didn't know she was a suffragist, but she, she was. Um, but, you know, some of the great names, I was at the Great American Beer Festival and uh, a beer that won um, in the, uh, it was a, a session IPA and it was called Trump Hands, um, which everybody got a kick out of, you know, because it was a small beer. Um, and so, and there's like tactical nuclear penguin is one barbarian Streisand was another, um, uh, uh, Audrey Hepburn, Hepburn. Uh, and then there were some oh, tart side of the moon. That was another one that was pretty good. So people will use, uh, you know, their favorite bands, um, to come up with names. Um, oh gosh, what was another one? Uh, pathological lager, you know? And so they come up Some people like there's a Utah beer called polygamy Porter. Um, that I thought was pretty creative. There's a Monty Python b- uh, beer called the Holy Grail Ale, get it, G-R-A-L. Um, and then, so there's just so many creative names out there. If you can come up with them, boy, they try to trademark them right away. And once they trademark them, then yeah. you can't do your beer that anymore. You're done. The other done. interest, the, the other interest, I mean, listen, I'll go back to the, the beer stores that I go to, and I know you do too, but man, you go and... It, it's an art installation too, right? I mean, some of the labels on some of these beers, these are like art galleries. Some of the things that are done on some of these cans of beer out there. Well, you look at, I mean, so you look at, you go to your shelf space, you go to consumers and you go wherever you go. You look at that wall, you're like, your beer's got to stand out somehow, right? And, and it's funny that everybody's got a friend and I'm sure you do too. Like we all do, the friend is an artist or whatever, you know? And, and that's where a lot of these, you know, labels come from, from these brewers. It's like, oh yeah, my buddy's a graphic designer and he does all my labels. You know, so it's, it's how they stand out when you're looking at all that huge wall of beers. How is your can going to stand out? It is funny because you will see that can that's bright and sticks out and you'll look at it and you're like, hmm, I don't know if I like this because you literally now have to examine the can. You got to figure out what kind of beer it is. Right. I, I'm typically a low ABV guy. So I, I, I purpose in and, and lower IBU guy. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, w- I will purposely look at those numbers. Um, but yeah, it's whatever catches your eye in terms of the stores. A lot of times when you're, when you're buying, that's, that's for sure. So um, two more things with you. Uh, Paul Leone is with me. He's one of my best friends. And I'm so happy we could do this. Um, you are the executive director of the New York State Beer Association. And you deal directly with the craft brewers here in Western New York. You mentioned close to 500, if not there yet craft brewers here in western new york and a ton in buffalo and more coming um over the next six months i asked you about in terms of um uh, uh an idea an entrepreneurial beer idea about instead of having a food or an ice cream truck having a beer truck because i think it would be really cool like if you're if, if you're you know in your neighborhood and you hear that i don't know what song it would be or if it would be a silly bell or whatever the hell it would be right. you know if you're an adult and you're like Oh my God. Cause the kids have their ice cream truck, right? Yeah. Now you're an adult. I want my beer truck. I want my beer truck to be right driving around my neighborhood. He's got a tap right there. Boom. There's my pint of fill in the blank, or he's got beer. He can sell me right out of his truck. Oh my God, this is the greatest thing ever. And I know now a lot of craft brewers are getting into sort of the, the beer delivery thing with, you know, if it's Uber eats or Uber beers or whatever. Um, but they're getting into sort of that area but I always thought a beer truck would be a really, really cool thing to do. But you told me that there's some loopholes and some red tape legalese things that have prevented those things from happening, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, we're still guided by the three-tier system, which was, you know, created in 1933 at the end of Prohibition. So it's time for some things to change. Um, But the three-tier system, for those that don't know, you know, is basically after Prohibition and to make sure that mob rule didn't come back literally um, and with control of of everything. Um, So you have the manufacturers, which are the brewers that have to sell it to wholesalers, which is the second tier that have to sell it to retailers, which is your stores. And that's the order on how things go. Now, we've broken a little bit of that down, whereas, you know, you can go to a, it was only five or six years ago, believe it or not, you couldn't go to a brewery and order a pint of beer. This is only five or six years ago. You could only get a sample and then you could take beer to go. So we're slowly chipping away at the three-tier system. During COVID, um, we were allowed temporarily to have beer delivered um, legally and shipped. You could ship. Uh, you can still do that with some licensing things in New York State, but you know everybody wants packages delivered now. So the world is changing, uh, but you know beer trucks are still not allowed. There was a brewer in, in Albany that tried that and got shut down quickly. He had his little you know beer truck that he was driving around, and they said no, you can't do that. So you can't do that yet. 
I mean, but, could you could you imagine a, a college party where the beer truck pulls up? <laughs> yeah, well, you could. You can still have a beer truck. You just can't drive around. Right. Yeah, that's true. That's, you can park it. You're right. You're you right. can park it. Yeah, right. Exactly. You can't go to your you can't go to your neighborhood and and with all your neighbors, all your cool neighbors that you hang out with and just say, hey, everybody, you know, the beer truck's coming. The beer truck's coming. Who do I who, who do I need to petition? Yeah, because I will. Local, Senator Tim Kennedy. Yeah, go after. He'll do it. Go you're, to Tim Kennedy. Oh, well, yeah, he's a yeah. good Irish guy. He's, you know, yeah. I'm sure he likes to pull yeah. back a few fights anyway. Um, no, okay, but no, I'm, I'm I'm sort of small, little, tiny bit serious about this. Like maybe I'll write him and say, "Dude, let's get behind this. Let's make this happen." Yeah, um, baby steps. We're, you we're, know, we're, baby steps for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for people that are watching this, and and I'm hoping it's a lot of beer drinkers, and maybe the handful of people that are watching this actually make their own. If they're that dreamer craft brewer that that mm-hmm. wants to start up their own brewery and maybe eventually depending on how they do and where they go they have the tap room and then they go into distribution and all of that what what kind of capital these days does it take typically to start up a brewery that can be self-sufficient and productive enough to actually you know produce for a, i guess a regular crowd if that makes sense yeah the greatest thing i ever heard that if you want to make a million dollars owning a brewery start with two million um, you know, that's kind of really where it's at. It's not, it, it's funny, the, the, a lot of these folks think that these breweries are making money hand over fist because they're, they're, you know, tap rooms are full and they're selling a lot of beer. But man, you know, it's, a, it's a, an intense a business that it's craft beer, right? So it's handmade. So it's high employment. It's, uh, it, they're, they're, they're not making a lot. Very few breweries are making a lot of money. I can tell you that right now. Whenever they make any money, they put it right back in and get more tanks. So they hire more people and all of that. So it's a hard business. The people that own breweries today are really passionate about it because 90% of their job is not having a beer with you or me. It's uh, doing paperwork for brand label registration and registering uh, trademarks and and paying taxes and and dealing. I mean, it's just, it's a business. Um, But the people that do it are really passionate about it for sure. And clearly and they're really, seven day a week job. Sure. And they're really good at it too. I they're mean, really good at it. Yeah, we've, passionate about it. we've seen the industry explode here in Western New York and it only mm-hmm. continues to get bigger. I know I, I've, I've heard that Beltline, I think is going to be expanding at some point. Um, wow, obviously Big Ditch is going to build their new thing out in Williamsville by the throughway. That's going to be pretty exciting. New York Beer Project continues to expand. In fact, mm-hmm. they, uh, they left Buffalo to open one in Orlando or they're going to, I understand. Um, so... A lot of expansion continues with a lot of the local breweries. Other here. half is opening up in Buffalo now. They opened up in the Finger Lakes. They That's have right. In Washington, D.C. Yeah. Oh, here's a funny thing I noticed in my background here. Yeah. So if you remember, again, it's for, for the, some of the older folks, but you know what this is, right? Of course. Billy Beer, right? Billy Carter, yeah. yeah. Billy yeah. Carter, right. So for those of, of a certain generation, this was uh, Jimmy Carter's brother. Uh, really, was kind of like the first craft beer in a sense, but it really wasn't craft. But you know what the really great thing about this can is, and when I always... Uh, of where this particular can was brewed. Come on. Yeah, so the uh, West End Brewing Company, so it was a contract brewer in essence, right? Like they just, they brewed this beer in in different places around the country and Saranac, which is now Saranac, this Billy beer, all the Billy beer in the Northeast was brewed uh, in New York State. That's amazing. And by the way, Saranac pre-Saranac was Mm -hmm. Utica Club, Matt's, I mentioned the beer ball, Matt's. And I gotta tell folks, and I'm hoping that you would know this. Mm-hmm. It's in my dad used to take me and my brothers. We would go to the Adirondacks up to Inlet Old Forge every year in, in June or July. And we would take one day and we do a day trip to mm-hmm. that brewery in Utica. And I got to tell you, the tour is worth going on, man. It is mm-hmm. so cool. They have an incredible old school, old time tap room that looks like sort of prohibition era. It's um, been there since pre-prohibition. It's the yeah. same tap room. And it's, it's yeah. gorgeous. And the tour is really informative and lots of fun. They get a, they, they take you on a little trolley and they walk yep. you through the malt house and the brew house and in, in packaging and bottling and canning. It's, it's really, really neat. If you have a chance to ever go there, do it. Yeah. And it's funny. It's funny. They also own flying bison in Buffalo, by the that's way. Right. So, uh, you know, that's a good partnership there, but Utica club's a great beer. That's a, that's one of my, it's my golf beer for I, sure. But, I agree a hundred percent. And, and, you know, we, we obviously being Rochester guys grew up with, with Jenny and Tennessee, Pounders yeah. and, and Lights and, and 12 Horse, which by the way, I, I never really drank 12 Horse mm-hmm. until really in the last couple of years. 
I've, I've grown to love 12 horse. Yeah. They do a good Bach. Um, mm-hmm. and, and Jenny, they, I know have expanded to brewing a bunch of different, uh, beers there too. Right. Yeah. They're a big contract brewer, believe it or not. I mean, they just, I think they put in $50 million just recently into expanding their brewing system. And, um, they make all the Seagram's wine coolers and things that you, you see there. That's all made out of Genesee as well. And, you know, they, they've got their hands in everything. So it's the, it's the biggest brewery in New York state for sure. Yeah. That's interesting. Like I, I would not have thought that, uh, mm-hmm. because I would have thought Brooklyn brewery, but is Brooklyn brewery in New Jersey. Am I right? No. So Brooklyn brewery is actually in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Okay. They've got their own brewery there. They do a lot of their beer there, but all of their um, beer that you would see like uh, Brooklyn Lager and other things is brewed at Saranac in Utica. Got it. Okay. Interesting. Another yep. tie in there. That's yep. really cool. Um, yep. Yeah. I mean, listen, there are craft breweries all over New York state. I've been to them. I've been to one in Saranac Lake, Lake recently to Lake Placid recently, both terrific. I was one in Long Island city uh, a bunch of years ago. Terrific. I was in, in a couple in, in Glens Falls in Albany a couple of years ago and in Saratoga terrific there's great ones popping up in rochester and along the finger lakes even in some of the smaller towns around the finger lakes and great craft beers so uh, if you need a craft beer map if you're traveling anywhere in new york state it's really not that hard to find a craft brewery right no as a matter of fact we've got an app the new york craft beer app that you can download that has every brewery in the state on it and uh if you visit a brewery and you get a passport stamp you get a certain number of stamps we send you free stuff like, you know, it's a, I think we have close to 40,000 downloads already on it. Cause it's the only way you're going to find every brewery in the state. And so what I love about it is, uh, is that wherever I am, because there are so many breweries, there's a nearby brewery button on it. So when you hit nearby breweries, it'll tell you all the breweries like right around where you are. And, and I use it all the time and I don't, cause I don't even know where everybody is. There's right. So many, you know, that could, they're everywhere. That's funny. You, you know, we've been conditioned to use apps to tell us where there's a restaurant, a rest stop gas mm-hmm. now we can find out where there's a gin mill uh, right a pub anything. rather yep anything yeah right. any is, brewery in the state for sure and, and and ways will tell you if there's traffic around it and to avoid or not right so correct or your google maps or whatever you're using anyway well uh, anything i need to to touch on that i didn't yet about what you do for a living and and how great your job is because your job basically is to travel around the state and go to breweries and drink beer and talk to brewers and now it's not well not really but that's what we like people to think. Right. My job, right? <laughs> yeah. I wish that was my job. Right. Was, yeah. was that right. We could just travel. Maybe you, maybe you ought to take this on the road and we can do this on the road. You, I listen, you and I can go visit breweries and. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I can afford a, uh, a, a designated driver. Um, Cause we would need one. Cause we would, need we would one. need one for sure. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so listen, I want to have you on again to do this a little bit closer to the September 25th Buffalo date. Um, oh, awesome. if that's cool. Okay. Yeah. So at that point, you can talk about, you know, some of the, the brewers are going to be participating in some of the activities that are going to going on and all that stuff, tickets and yada, yada, yada. But um, for now, I love you, man. And I look forward to seeing you love in you person back. soon. Let's play some yeah. golf soon. Come to Buffalo, jump in my pool, drink some beers. I'll come see you and Kath and the kids and Webster. And um, m- more than anything, make sure you say hello to Rory McElroy for me. Yeah, right down the street, right? I know. Yeah, that yeah, that's a tease. People are like, what are you talking about? Well, that's a yeah. whole other thing. Yeah, can, yeah, look uh, it up. Look it up. Yeah, look it up. Look right. it up. Rory McElroy Webster. That's all you need to know, okay? Right. There that's is a the Western... Yeah, if you're a golf fan and you don't know, uh, there is a connection to Western New York with Rory mm-hmm. McElroy, who's one of the best ever, obviously. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, say hello to him when you see him next time. Yeah, yeah, we'll hang out and have a beer. When you're, when you're have... swimming in the grotto. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, pal. Right on. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me, man. Love you, dude. Love you back. Bye, man. See ya.